I felt intimidated too because I had not been exposed to this type of an environment where there are so many people there. Hi everyone, welcome to today's video. So on today's video, I'm going to help you understand the key lessons that you learn at Harvard, Stanford, INSEAD and all the other top MBA programs in 30 minutes absolutely for free. I'm going to speak about five specific points and five specific skills that you have to learn. You absolutely have to learn if you want to make money, if you want to grow your money, if you want to do well in your career, if you want to explore good things in life. These are five must have skills that you must cultivate. Best part, I'm going to actually show you how to cultivate these skills by giving you the specific resources that you must read up on and all the material that you need along with it. So let me kickstart the video by showing you a book and this is the book. It is called as Snapshots from Hell and it is a very fun read. It was written by Peter Robinson. Now Peter Robinson is an ex-speech writer for a president and he did his MBA from Stanford and he spoke about his Stanford experience. Now one of the stories from this book is very very fascinating, very interesting which encapsulates what it's like to study at top tier MBA programs, what is it that you actually learn versus not. So the story goes something like this, that there was a Stanford professor and he said that there can be two set of students at a Stanford MBA classroom. One set would study very diligently, they would do all the homework, assignments, bunch of different different things. The other set of students would not come in the class, they would just keep hitting golf balls all day on a golf course somewhere. After they graduate, both would get similar type of jobs. Why does that happen? Because a top tier MBA gives you two things. One you get excellent brand value. So a student who is playing golf all day and is not doing much, even he or she will graduate with a degree from Stanford, NCR, London Business School and all the top schools. Not a problem there that brand value will be associated with them and the sincere student will graduate with good marks but will again command the same brand value. That is part one and that is fairly obvious but the non-intuitive part of the story is that an MBA school allows you to cultivate a lot of skills both inside and outside the classroom. That is a very important point to grasp because these days we are slowly moving towards a world where what you learn outside the classroom has become much more important than what you learn inside a classroom. Very important sentence, rewind it and listen to it again because this is literally the bedrock of learning now. If you're not learning things, what is being taught both inside and outside the classroom, you might struggle very badly in your career. So this brings me to the five specific points that I want to talk on this video. I cannot compensate for the brand value that a top tier MBA program would give to you, right? So please, if you want that brand value, of course, go and attend top tier MBA programs, no doubt about that. But listening to this video will at least set the course and a direction in which you can start thinking so that you can start cultivating these five specific skills that are absolutely necessary in today's world. So the first skill that top tier MBA programs try to teach their students is effective communication. I have spoken about it a lot. I have made a separate course on effective communication. You can check that entire course out. It's completely free. You will learn a lot from it. But an abridged version of this would be that first and foremost, people assume that effective communication means that your English should be really high five. No, nothing of that sort. Essentially, effective communication simply means that if I say 10 things and if you are able to understand nine things, that is effective communication. If you are able to communicate effectively with your classmates, if you are able to communicate effectively with your boss, if you are able to communicate effectively with your clients, if you are able to communicate clearly with your teammates and bunch of different different people that work with you or interact with you, it automatically helps you communicate your point very effectively, clearly and they understand whatever you want from them. That is the simple definition and utility of having strong communication skills. Now, of course, your question would be that, okay, Akshat, can you tell us some tips and strategies for improving our communication skills? So I come from a very small town in India. So the first time I went to INSEAD, it was a very dramatic, drastic shift and experience for me, right? I was interacting with people from over 80, 85 nationalities. It was a very fascinating time for me. I felt intimidated too because I had not been exposed to this type of an environment where there are so many people there. So I learned the first key lesson from my communications professor and he was an ex-BBC journalist, right? So super impressive person, had done communication training for top CEOs of the world. What did he teach us in his class? He taught a lot of things. But one key lesson was that when you're trying to communicate, use two things. One is that always use structures, right? Whenever you're trying to communicate. For example, if someone asks you, introduce yourself then always have structured response in place, right? Start from start to end. For example, I grew up in this particular city. 
then in college this was what I did then in work this is what I did so there is a structure you are flowing through a story it's a very simple process use some kind of structure I will teach you more what structures are subsequently on this video but first key tip that always use structures while communicating super important for you to communicate your information to any type of audience second key thing please try to control the pace at which you speak when it comes to majority of Indians or Chinese people they tend to speak very fast it is okay when you are speaking with other Indians at a very brisk tone not a problem there but due to differences in your accent when you are interviewing with someone from outside India probably an Italian or a Spanish or a Portuguese person and if you are speaking at a very fast pace they might not be able to catch a lot of information what you are giving them again it violates the key principle of communication that the simple aspect of communication is that if you are saying 10 points and if other person is not able to understand 9 points then yeah you need to improve so doing the basics right again here's the link to my course you can go watch it completely free you will learn a lot from it incorporate all those basics this will help you get to a certain level then second thing that you need to do is that you need to build confidence now confidence comes from putting yourself in a situation which is unfamiliar for example when you go and speak on a stage so that is a slightly high stress environment it challenges you to improve your communication skill one great platform to build your communication skills and improve your communication style is Cambly because you learn from unfamiliar people you get to engage interact with them the tutors are very friendly and they will coach you in the right way it's a good platform you can check it out it can help you build more confidence and will allow you to take your existing skills to the next level but build the basics first now the second key thing that you will learn at a business school is networking and these days networking has become such a critical such an important skill now why has it become such an important or critical skill very simple reason that we live in a world post COVID-19 what happened in 2020 is that it literally disrupted the networking philosophy completely because the zoom meetings came into the picture and they just revamped the way we looked at networking what used to happen before 2020 was that if you were to network with someone it used to have a lot of barriers for example when I was trying to network with people back in 2016 2017 then in order to speak with someone you had to schedule a phone call a meeting then you have to go and physically meet them then write a thank you note and bunch of different different things so there was a lot of time lag that was involved in it and in a month you could do five six such meetings because every meeting used to take a lot of time to schedule go back and forth therefore even great networkers people who are excellent at networking they could at most network with five six people but post 2020 or even during 2020 what happened was that the zoom culture came into the picture it became super easy for people to network with each other and now it has become almost critical for anyone to become a good networker why because if you don't network then even an average networker can get around 20 30 meetings in a month easily so therefore you lose out in a big way if you're not networking with people so now you would say okay Aksha tell me how can I improve my networking skills it sounds really important so first and foremost go and watch my free course again excellent resource for you to develop your networking skills but there are two specific points that I would like to condense and explain it to you so let me take you to my LinkedIn and help you explain this point in a more elaborate manner right so usually what happens is that if you are a student and if you are trying to network with someone you would try to get a job so what is the usual modus operandi what you would do is that okay you will go to person's name for example Pavan is one of my partners on one of the ventures called as cases over coffee so you will go on Pavan's profile right you will scroll through it you will say that okay he has worked at McKinsey then you will look at his profile okay cases over coffee management consultant etc etc and then you will go to this message tab and you will start typing stuff that hey Pavan loved your profile can you speak for 15 minutes with me or hey Pavan you are an ex McKinsey can you please forward my resume within your firm these type of messages do not get you anywhere because there are so many requests that people like Pavan get all the time so therefore it becomes impossible for people like Pavan or any busy person to entertain all these requests so what do you need to do first and foremost you need to build a relationship right you need to build a relationship this is the first key point and second is that you need to follow a value add approach so how do you do this how do you build a relationship and how do you focus on creating a value add approach so first and foremost don't just simply go on the message tab and start blurting out random messages go and check on the person whom you want to connect with so in our example let's say that you want to connect with Pavan 
So look at his activities, look at what he posts on social media. If he is active on social media, go to his Twitter, Facebook, whatever information you can find on him. Look at posts and other things that he's posting regularly. So for example, if you take a look at his latest post, he's talking about work-life balance, employees, etc. Right? Then you look at effective conversations, networking, he has given some tips, right? That how to network effectively. Similarly, he has talked about a lot of topics. So curate the topics that he's talking about and how do you build relationship with him? Very simple, right? Go on the comment tab and whenever he makes a new post, start engaging in an interesting manner with him. For example, let's look at this post, right? Here he talks about three things that lead to effective conversations, networking, right? Listening, stop thinking, don't be desperate. Now, if you have something good to say or add to this particular point, do it, right? You can say that, hey, Pavan, great explanation. I have learned this from my experience that this is also a viable point. I completely concur with your points. This is also what I have realized because I recently went through this experience with my boss and you narrate that experience. So that is called as engaging meaningfully. Now, every time Pavan posts and you are engaging with him in a meaningful manner, he will recall your name. So when you drop an email to him, when you drop a LinkedIn message to him, the chances are that he would recall your name and would respond to your request, whatever request you are making. This brings me to the second point, which is the value add approach. Please just don't go to random people and say that, you know what, can you give me a job? Or can you please refer me to McKinsey? Or can you please refer me to Bain? Please don't do that. It does not help. You must always explain your value add. For example, if you're reaching out to Pavan, hey Pavan, I love your post and I've been engaging with your post for the last five months. It has been a fabulous experience reading all your posts and learning from you. I see that you're working as an entrepreneur and there might be a lot of help that you might be needing. So is there any way that I can work with you or can I volunteer on these three specific points that I'm a website designer, I can do this and that. Try to show what type of value you can bring to the other person that will allow you to sustain your relationship. Now, it's not mandatory that you start going and building relationships with everyone from that perspective, but whomever you want to reach out to from your own industry or if you're looking for a job switch, these two techniques, use it so that it allows you to build a network. Why? Because when you're going to a business school, this network somewhat get built automatically because you get to engage with your peers in terms of parties and informal settings so that common brand is there, that common bond is there. So the network becomes stronger. But if you're not going to a top tier institute, then you have to put in this legwork of creating your online communities by adding value to others. Now, the third thing that you will learn at a business school is business problem solving. Now, what is business problem solving? As you might know that a business has multiple functions associated with it, whether it's marketing, whether it's finance, whether it's operations. So every business would have multiple angles and functions to it. So when you go to a business school, they teach you how to analyze businesses holistically. How do business schools do it? So you might have heard that at Harvard, they give you a case to study. So you prepare for that case. You learn things online, then you enter the classroom and then you start having discussion with your peers and your teachers around that case. Now, of course, you can't replicate this entire ecosystem around you on your own. It is very complex to do it, but at least you can get access to some of these cases. These are online. These have been remodeled and you can learn a lot by reading those cases. For example, let me take you through one of these cases that you can easily find. So this was the case that was presented. Now it will have a bunch of different, different information about this business. So read about it, what the SWOT analysis says, what the business was about, and bunch of different, different things. How they have used Porter's Five Forces analysis. If you do this business analysis exercise, you will get really good at analyzing any type of business that is presented to you. How will this help, right? This will help in the fact that number one, if you're doing any job, you're essentially working for a business. So of course, you will be able to contribute more. That's one. Second thing, if you're investing in stock markets, you might have seen that I also analyze a bunch of businesses. I've been doing it for years now. So your business analysis skills get really sharp by reading these type of cases. You can explore online articles like Harvard Business Review. You can read The Economist. You can read a bunch of different, different articles. I will talk about that in a minute also. But I hope you get the picture that developing this business skill is very important for you if you want to do well in your career going forward, especially in the business world. Now, before I move on to the next point, let me just quickly explain some of the resources that you can explore. Harvard Business Review is a great resource. You can explore online articles on Economist. You can also read something like BCG Insights or McKinsey Quarterly. These have bunch of good articles that you can educate yourself on to learn more about the business world. All right, so that brings us to the fourth point, which is 
structured thinking. If you want to do really well in your career, then you have to think in structures and buckets. What is exactly meant by structured thinking and why is it necessary? All right. So structured thinking simply means that you are able to break apart a very complicated problem that is presented to you into simple thinking frameworks. So let's understand this from an example. So if the question is that how would you go about thinking on a problem that how many Google searches happen in a day across the world. So this is a highly complicated problem that you have to estimate the number of searches that is undertaken on Google every single day all across the world. Such a complex problem. So how will you start thinking about it? So you can say that total number of searches would be number of people, number of people using the internet, right? Times the number of hours they use the internet and in an hour, how many times they search for a information, right? So this is the type of case problems that you frequently get even at schools like ISB and in management consulting interview and bunch of other different places. So they test you out. So it's very important to understand how you can on the fly create these type of formulas, how you further break it apart. For example, number of people using the internet, how will you estimate it? I'm not looking for an exact answer, right? So if you are looking to solve this block one, how will you do it? How will you estimate this? So for example, on this, you can take a look at population, right? The world population is what percentage? Out of this, you can divide people into different, different buckets. For example, you can call it rich, right? Then you can call it middle class. Then you can call it lower middle class, lower middle class, and then lower strata, right? Then you can segregate population among these four different buckets, right? And then from there, you can get a percentage estimation of how many people would be using the internet. So this is called as structuring, that you have structured the problem really well, that you broke it apart into first three buckets. Then within bucket one, you have created different pockets and you have tried to estimate it. How do you develop this skill? So I'll not solve this problem for you. I will give this to you as a homework. Go and solve it. I'll check some of the answers in the comment box and I'll try to reply them. But the important point is that how do you develop this skill? So there is something called as case study book. If you go online and type Kellogg case study book or NCR case study book, you will get these case books and interview guide and you can literally download them and read through them. So this will help you at least develop the basic fundamentals of structured thinking. Again, these are completely free and you can learn a ton of information from it. Now comes the final part or the final skill that I would like to talk about that is taught in an intuitive manner at a business school and the skill is called as 80-20 thinking. Now 80-20 thinking is a life skill. I would say I frequently use it. I have been using it for more than a decade now and I have reaped numerous advantages in it. No matter what you're doing, this 80-20 principle is going to help you massively in life. So what is 80-20 principle? It simply says that to generate 80% of the results, you just need to put in 20% of the work. A classic example of this would be that if you are trying to clear the exam, you have not studied anything, you just have three days left, what are you going to do? You need to get some results, right? So you are simply going to look at the past 10 years paper of your engineering school or arts college, whichever degree that you are trying to pursue. You will solve those 10 years questions in three to four days. You will write the exam and hopefully you will pass. What could have been the other approach? The other approach could have been that you buy all the textbooks, then you read all your tuition notes, and you read a bunch of things online, then you try to pass the exam. So in this second approach, you would have definitely missed. But the 80-20 thing that generated 80% results for you just by undertaking 20% of the work was finding a shortcut of solving just last 10 years papers. So this was a smart way of studying. This was the 80-20 principle. And if you keep on incorporating this for anything that you're doing, if you want to become an effective learner, rather than learning the entire textbook of Spanish, just pick 500 very important words from Spanish, mug it up first, right? And try to learn from it. That will fasten your approach to learning a language. Similarly, if you want to become a better writer, tell me, what are you going to do? How are you going to incorporate that 80-20 principle? So always think about efficiency drivers that you are trying to undertake. Similarly, if you want to improve your confidence in terms of speaking in English, go check out the Cambly app. It's a wonderful app. You will learn a lot by speaking with native speakers and this is me speaking with a tutor from Cambly.
you have been teaching on camly or do you do like other stuff yes. along with this yes it's been um, since the beginning of the year i think i had my 6 month anniversary last uh, week <laughs> i got a nice message from camly thank you camly <laughs> if you can see on youtube thank you for the message <laughs> okay uh yeah that's right that's all right so i hope you enjoyed this video give it a thumbs up and i will see you the next time